Welcome to the Spaghetti Junction Boys podcast coming to you from beautiful Atlanta, Georgia. As always, I'm your host, William R. Hildebrand, and I'm joined here by Ben Ralston and Doc Jacobson. Before we get things started here, we want to thank the folks over at Manscaped. Support for the Spaghetti Junction Boys podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code SJBAtlanta at manscaped.com. If my math is correct, that's over 8 million balls. We were sent packages from Manscaped for our packages included, and there was the one, the only, Lawnmower 4.0. This trimmers the future of grooming and features a cutting-edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin-safe technology. The Lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof and also has a 400K LED spotlight in case you need a more precise shave. If you're anything like me, you still have shaving remnants from 2016 somewhere around your bathroom. Well, thanks to the waterproof technology, say goodbye to the mess on the bathroom floor. Say hello to a cleaner, fresher shave. It's time to take care of yourself, so go to manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with the code SJBAtlanta at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com when you use code SJBAtlanta. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. So I want to start the show off by saying uh, we have been approached approached by an investor. Apparently he made, and I don't want to name names because confidentiality is a huge, huge thing, but uh, apparently he made a takeover attempt at $43 billion at Twitter, and now he's made... I don't want to say a similar offer uh, for the SJB Atlanta podcast. And so I figured instead of broaching it uh, in any pre-show meetings, I, I just wanted to bring this to the air. What are the terms and conditions? Uh, the terms and conditions, first of all, it was a non-negotiable, apparently, that you wear a Nebraska shirt on each and every podcast. Uh, that was I, – I tried to combat that when I first got the paperwork over. Uh, it's a pretty lengthy docu-sign. Um, also, Ben is required to wash his hands of anything left-handed. If he's shown doing anything left-handed on the podcast, we're actually going to court. I I don't think I've ever done anything with either hand on the podcast, to be fair. All right. Well, that's a good start. So that should be relatively easy. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's... I don't know, give, giving up control like this. I, I didn't expect this so early, but you know, once I saw Twitter uh, being approached about a sale, I kind of knew logically we were next. Yeah, I don't know if I can get in line with wearing a Nebraska shirt. I mean, that's just, that hits me right to the core. I mean, we gotta be talking some big, big money if we're throwing out me wearing a, a Nebraska shirt once a week for the rest of my life. And another condition was you have to make the background of your office look less like a Buffalo Wild Wings. And that I got really worried about. I didn't know if that was possible or not. God, I'm getting hit from every side versus, uh, you know, not by me, not by me at all. Phantom Angel Investor, you know, people I'm seeing right now, they don't like the way I got my house set up. Not happy. I mean, Ben, do you have any sort of recourse that we we should take here no I, as the as the pods lawyer i suggest we roll over accept all terms and just sign i mean we, really, i don't think we have another option we just show them our belly at this point yeah yeah rub our belly we've given up okay well <laughs> stay tuned we'll, we'll see how it all shakes out uh and maybe we're going to space i guess we'll we'll kind of see how that shakes oh out. i'm not going to space <laughs> That's a was, out on space. Yeah, that is like so risky, and the payoff is like essentially just views, which is not worth it. Okay, first of all, that's a horrible millennial take because everything is worth views. And second of all, think think of just the worst thing that could happen. You're going up towards space, and then you crash down. That's a pretty great way to go out. Because, you know, there's there's tons of ways that you hear of lots of people going. And I, I'm pretty sure we're all mortal. I'm not 100% on that. And we'll get into that more later on. 
But if if we are indeed mortal, there's worse ways to go than oh, Ben died doing what he loved, going to space. But I'm on record right here as that's not what I love. So, mm. I don't know. I I I kind of feel like that's 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 just a win win for me. Of just oh man, did you hear about William Hildebrand? Yeah, <laughs> died going to space. I mean. Listen, if I'm going to die going to space, Crash is definitely last on my list. Uh, gunfight with Martians first on the list. I thought you meant me dying going to space was a win-win for you. And I was I was really <laughs> offended. <laughs> yeah, that, that's how we'd start every subsequent podcast is it's Doc and William here. Of course, Ben, rest in stars, uh, as you all know. Rest in pieces. I would want like the, the intro sequence to be like the reading rainbow thing, but it's my <laughs> face instead of a star. Like just totally lean into it. Yeah, no, we we would not be gentle about <laughs> how we handle a single bit of that. <laughs> oh. uh, change our intro song to "In the Arms of an Angel." <laughs> exactly right. I don't I don't think we have the rights, but hey, with this new money coming in, who knows? We'll buy uh, it. I, we could also do the first podcast from space. Have you thought about that? That's worth the views. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what kind of Wi-Fi we'd get up there. But anyway, speaking of which, we want to get into a dissect this tweet this week. I came across a tweet where someone crudely drew a red circle on an iPhone photo of the sun coming through clouds. It's someone named Immaculate Ream on Twitter. And the caption was, how can you see sunlight rays through the clouds from a sun that's 93 million miles away? You can't. This is only possible with a local sun. Now, Doc, as our resident science expert, what do you make of this? Uh, total tomfoolery. I dug into this tweet and the subsequent, uh, subsequent you know, responses and the thread and everything. And this is just a ploy by the flat earth community to try to prove that the earth is flat once again. Uh, I, they brought on the likes of famous people, Kyrie Irving, uh, amongst others, I believe Scientology might be wrapped into flat earth theory. I don't know. But what this is all about is the close sun theory, that the theory is the sun cannot be so far away to actually see the rays come through the clouds like that. I don't want to get into too much scientifics, but it's totally possible. It's water vapor, it's refraction, it's light, it's physics, it's doable. Flat earthers are dumb. I lost a lot of brain cells digging into this one. So don't be fooled out there, people. But how could this be a flat earth thing? Because when, when the earth being round and being in orbit get us closer to a sun, it seems like the whole crux of this was they're just saying, stay woke out there. The sun's closer than it may appear. Well, they think that because uh, with it being flat, it actually allows it to get closer to the sun because all parts of the earth are land masses that, you know, visualize sun would be closer in effect rather than, you know, the nighttime, daytime, which I still haven't figured out how that isn't taken into account for. Like it's daytime here in Atlanta right now, but you go to China or Australia, it's nighttime. Like how are we just not going to account for that if the earth's flat? Well, it's like two sides of a paper, just yeah. going through space, drifting toward the sun. And the one on the bottom part of the paper, you're Australia in this scenario. They're not facing the sun, your local sun. So it's dark. No, I'm, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> just no. Just, just not possible. Or they're hanging on to the paper upside down. The physics doesn't work like that. The gravity does not work in a flat plane like that. Gravity is a circle, much like our electromagnetic field is a circle. This whole flat earth idea is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. If you look out over the ocean, you could see the horizon dropping away from you. I just, I, I can't stand flat earthers anymore. Well, what about if you're looking at a table? You can see the end of a table and a table is flat. You put a four mile long table out there into the horizon away from you. You're not going to see the end of it, dude. I don't know. I haven't seen a table that big. So that's just kind of reckless speculation on your part. They call me Reckless Randy for a reason on the weekends, baby. Come on. And I think it's completely possible that we could have localized suns of, hey, this is your sun, this is my sun. I've never seen two suns in the same place at the same time. 
And so they could be very regional. In fact, we've seen one sun that Wiley Coyote blown into, of course, mm -hmm. dynamite hit, he went flying and he can't fly 93 million miles away. That is way too far for a cartoon coyote to be flying through space. I don't know if you've heard of gravity, but it just doesn't make sense. Secondly, I've also seen footage, I don't know if everyone's seen this footage or if I'm just privy to it, of a um, documentary called Teletubbies that has a baby <laughs> that is actually the sun. I don't know how old that baby is. I don't know if this baby is evergreen, if that's possible, or if there's numerous babies that are sons, but it was one some of the most compelling footage I've seen. You're Spider-Man homecoming this too much. We don't live in a multiverse. There's no alternate universes out there. I don't care how many Marvel movies they make about it or how many times A52 makes a movie about it. There's no such thing as a multiverse or universe. You got one life to live, live it to the fullest. I don't believe that. Yeah, did I you see this with YOLO? We're yeah. trying to talk sons here. <laughs> Well, you're talking about alternate universes and alternate dimensions no. of Teletubbies. Teletubbies are real now? I, I, I guess they are on video, so they're somewhat real. Exactly right. Blackfish, that SeaWorld documentary, I saw that on TV. Teletubbies, also a documentary, saw on TV. And I'm not talking about a multiverse. I'm talking about multi-suns within the same universe. So, so now every planet has their own sun? Or what, what, every every con country has their own sun? What are we getting at here? Listen, is it hot in Florida? Yes. Is it hot in Minnesota? Typically, no. Different suns, more powerful suns. People talk about the different sunburn you can get in Mexico. Boom. You know why? Different sun. Local suns. More local. Exactly right. Shop local, suntan local. The worst one I saw in this thread was they showed a, a plane up above the clouds and they somehow had refraction of the sun being under them in the clouds. So like, oh, that's, that's clearly local sun. Probably Florida. Probably. Well, I mean, you guys know that. I don't <laughs> How much do you want me to get into the science here? I mean, there's a tilt in the Earth's axis, which helps with our gravity. And so when you're coming around the sun, you're further away. You're going to be colder. Allegedly. From which sun? Yeah, exactly right. Thank you. <laughs> this is like when I tried to explain to my wife that every cable television show is really a spinoff of Lost, and she, it, I lost her immediately. But so I, I, you I lost her with Lost. Perfect. <laughs> well, did you ever see there was a guy on Twitter who connected every Adam Sandler movie? He created an Adam Sandler universe. And he got deep into the weeds and he was saying like it all is in, it's connected in some way, which if you see TMZ pictures of Adam Sandler just walking around New York City in like basketball shorts to his ankles and like a Sean John t-shirt that he bought from a Kohl's in 2004, I don't think that's the look of a guy who's existing on another plane of cinematic brilliance than the rest of us. And I also think it's more possible that he just got lazy when it came to thinking of new characters and new names. Are there more Adam Sandlers or Sons? I mean, I'm, I, there's no way local to Adam Sandler. You have your local Louisiana Adam Sandler. Finally, this is all starting to make a lot of sense. <laughs> um, so this is this whole thread on Twitter is back scientifically, Doc. Is that what I was? I, that's kind of what I was getting from what you were saying. Is that right? Uh, the the are the, the cases out there. You know, if you believe in flat Earth and you believe in all the hoopla, there's definitely some science there that you know doesn't prove it, but doesn't disprove it. So you play in the gray area all day. All right, perfect. Well. I'm I'm excited, and if I ever am having a fit with my local sun, I may just move and find a better sun, a more sunny sun. I hate that I'm almost turned into this local sun theory now. <laughs> I've been thinking about like, yeah, well, maybe you know, that whole Minnesota cold, Florida hot thing kind of got me. Mm -hmm. A weaker local sun. So speaking of nature, as we're gonna stay with our. Um, with doc to help us along the science of this all which is why everyone's watching and listening is because they want to learn something a slimy carnivorous toxic immortal worm 
has been discovered in Louisiana. Chris Carlton, uh, director emeritus at the LSU Ag Center said, quote, they're not dangerous, they're unusual and kind of strange and they gross people out because they're slimy, but that's about it. But then he went on to say, they are predators. So they're most commonly known as a hammerhead flatworm or a shovel worm due to their shape, but they do eat other organisms. Uh, and there's probably five or six different species similar to them in North America. So a worm that's going to live forever and is going to eat meat as well, they're going to rule the earth and we need to start respecting them, no? Yeah, this is a new version of the pythons that took over Florida, except worse. Like I'm shaking over here, shitting bricks. I think Doc is mocking you, Billy. Wow. I mean, <laughs> Ben, I, am I wrong in this? Should we not fear and possibly worship these worms? When they grow uh, arms and legs, I'll be worried. Well, I'm, I'm just curious how and how they know that these are immortal. Did they see one of the worms like, man, that one looks like shit. How old is this worm, dude? He's probably been around forever. Like, I think they stopped at the Deke House at LSU before getting into, like, the science portion of this. It sounds like, like, Bayou folklore where, like, this worm has been alive for generations and we've tracked it. We're like, God, I don't think that's right. Do you think it's, it was something that's been passed down from generation to generation in a jar for one family? It's just, my granddaddy had this worm and his granddaddy had this worm and he's passing down this worm. This is Papa's, Papa's, Papa's worm. <laughs> okay, I take back my sarcasm. I just read into this story some more. If you cut this worm into four pieces, it grows four new heads. Mm -hmm. This is not like regrowing itself and, you know, like normal worms do. It actually creates four new worms. Well, if it wanted to be Holy useful, it'd grow, it'd grow two new arms and two new legs and start really getting pro productive. That, that's true. If you, you bait this worm, it ain't pulling itself off the hook yet. So yeah. that's a fair point. Yeah, I, I definitely don't think we need to be supporting these worms financially. If, if they really want to grow in this world, they're going to have to pull themselves up by their bootstrap, you know? Yeah. Is that what you're so I saw recently that a lot of medicine comes out of like nature and the rainforest, right? So do you think like there's something we could extract from this worm to give ourselves regenerative like abilities? I don't know. I'm, I'm starting to think that this worm may be from outer space. And with this otherworldly worm, uh, I think we've just been giving aliens too much credit this whole time. We're like, oh, they're super intelligent. They have these huge brains. They build spaceships. They cruise here to there to there. When really it was just like a big ball of these worms all rolled up together and it came crashing down in the bayou. And it's just like, aliens are here. Like we, we did find out from the Navy last year and it got buried as we've talked about in the news that they know that aliens exist. So does LSU. So these worms discovered the bayou and we're like, this is paradise. We don't want to leave earth now. Yeah. Or are they on a mission? Yeah. I don't know. I, I definitely think that coach O would have used this as a recruiting tactic. If he knew about these before he got fired of just, Hey, you want to come on down to LSU? Not only are we going to win national title, but we got worms that never die. You ever seen something like that? No, come on down. Didn't he have a pregame speech where he put worms in his mouth and we're like <laughs> pulling them out too? That I want to hear. I heard a story about that with Coach O. I'm not sure I understand. I just, <laughs> Gary just activated on my phone because of you asking about that, Doc. And. I, I think she just kind of had a mild panic attack because she's heard of another local Siri that has had to use Ed Orgeron. The, the less miles ate grass, and I assume there were some worms in there. Yeah. <laughs> I would love if less miles went in to get a physical, and the doctor's like, well, uh, the samples came back, and you're positive for like five different kinds of worms. It's like, oh, man, how could that have ever happened? <laughs> Well, uh, unless I don't know you terribly well, you don't come in here a ton. Uh, but if I were to hazard a guess, I'd say it's you constantly just eating parts of the earth. 
Yeah, so reporting from sportsnews.com, uh, Ed Ogeron once held live worms in his mouth to motivate players. I knew I heard that somewhere. I bet they lost that game. Yeah, that, that could not have gone well. I, I can't imagine that in, you know, they're interviewing someone on the field after the game. You got Molly McGrath down there, and she's like, so what was the difference today against Alabama? It's like, well, you know, we, we didn't really feel up for it today. Uh, pretty sluggish coming into game day. But then when we saw Coach O eating a lot of insects, it just really flipped the script for us. And we knew we had to come out here and get that win for him and those worms. I thought you were going somewhere with the sluggish bit. Like, uh, yeah. <laughs> that is how you kill these worms, apparently. Dump salt or vinegar on them. Just kill them like a slug. Immortal my ass. <laughs> yeah. I'm. I can handle salt so much better than these worms. The other thing is, when you go to kill a worm, you don't, like, pull out a knife and be like, let me cut it in half. You just stomp on it and squish it to death. Like, how is it going to survive that? Its guts are all over the ground. I don't kill worms regularly. Yeah, me neither. I just I don't have a vendetta. Yeah, I'm not walking along the sidewalk and just like, you son of a bitch, what are you doing here? I get it. There was a rainstorm, but enjoy hell and just pull a knife out of my pocket. In fact, when I see the dried worms on the pavement, I'm like, ah, oh, damn, that that sucks. Oh, so you're pro worm. I'm very well, not these, but uh, yeah, I'm generally pro worm. Okay, put it on the record. Let I'm, it an, I'm anti worm. I step on those suckers every single time. Uh, I'm ambivalent to worms, so we really just have no consensus on this podcast regarding worms. I I do want to know how reckless that one person in the lab was that cut them into four pieces. Because someone found this worm and was like, look how cool this is. I saw it eating a bug. Have we ever seen a worm do that? And look at its head and all this. And he's like, what do you think would happen if I cut that son of a bitch into four pieces? Like, what? Mark, don't. It's like, is everything okay at home? <laughs> Why do we have to keep telling you this? Don't cut our animals into pieces. No. That motherfucker looked at me weird. I'm gonna cut this son of a bitch in four. It's like, ah, oh, this is it's every time with you, man. Every time. And so we, it double it from twice. Like you just cut that thing in half. Like it's insane to go to four. Yeah. That's that's like when you you hear from a, a sheriff or a detective about a violent crime, and anytime there's like a stab like 20 <laughs> times, you're like, oh, it's a crime of passion. This guy just kept cutting this worm. And I am curious if he's done this to other animals. He's just like, hey, so um, I did my independent research on one of the fish that we found. Uh, I cut it into 10 different pieces and it died. Like, yes. No, of course it did. That, that kind of goes in line with what we know about animals. But then when he got this worm, he's like, y'all will never get <laughs> what just happened. I cut this some bitch in four. I, I have to imagine that's his only job in the lab. I was going to say, I think we need Mike the Tiger in protective custody. Like, does not need to be at LSU anymore. Yeah, exactly right. What, what I didn't see in that article is how big these get. Because could these be like the 90s thriller franchise Tremors? Are they going to be that big? They better not. Well, not if this guy keeps cutting them into four. <laughs> I think he just made a very powerful enemy with these worms. Like they, these worms go back to their hideout and he's enemy number one picture on the wall. They said, we're coming for him. We've, we've developed a taste for flesh. We love it. And we're coming for you. <laughs> Guys. I, I think I found a, another possible issue with these worms. They're also cannibals. They eat other worms. Wow. Like, they, yeah, they eat worms, slugs, insects, snails, and earthworms. These guys are screw carnivorous. They're omnivorous. They're eating everything out there. They're hungry. Yeah. These worms gotta eat. I'm still pro worm. A doc won't change my mind. Mm hmm. I'm anti worm. I'm starting to think we don't have to worry about them as much if they're just going to be eating each other. It's a worm eat world, uh, worm eat worm world out there. And the only one I'm can nervous about is if we put all these things together and they start eating each other, there's going to be one final granddaddy worm who's eaten all the other worms. 
and so we just have to kill that one. It's like when people say, hey, do you want to fight one horse or horse-sized duck or like 30 duck-sized horses? It's just, hey, do you want to fight off millions of hammerhead carnivorous worms or do you just want to fight the big one granddaddy of them all? Hmm. I think we, we send the military in and just take out the big one and we're fine. And we got like a Godzilla situation where they're launching nukes at him and he doesn't even get phased. And then if God forbid it does get phased by a nuclear war and survives or a nuclear bomb, it's just going to get stronger. I mean, you, you got to you got to drop a building on that thing or something. Honestly, I think that this uh to go off what you're saying about Godzilla, the scariest thing we could see is if it does if they do start all eating each other and we do have that one big granddaddy worm and then he slithers into the bayou. Cuz then he's out of our hands, we don't have eyes on him. Is he getting bigger? Is he getting stronger? Is he getting nuclear? We don't know at that point. And then it's all just a big waiting game. Waiting for the other shoe to drop of when this worm is going to reemerge from the swamp. <laughs> Anything else on this worm? Okay. <laughs> so we're getting away from Doc's expertise and getting into Ben's as our chief legal expert. It's on the business card. Uh, a law class, a law and society course in their professor, retired New Jersey Superior Court Judge Lawrence Jones, have submitted an 82-page document to MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred making a case for former Detroit Tigers pitcher Armando Galarraga to be added to the list of perfect games after he was denied one in 2010 after an umpire erroneously ruled that the final out had beaten a throw to first base. So, Ben, do we have a case? I I will argue on behalf of Mr. Galarraga. Okay. I, do not, I do not. My client does not want this overturned. What would you rather? What would you rather be on record with a perfect game or have the most notorious perfect not perfect game ever? I think I'd rather have a perfect game because he has really nothing else to his baseball resume. He had a very ho hum career. Otherwise, you want to be the perfect game guy. You go to like trading card conventions through a perfect game. Ah, wait, no, actually, I just talked myself into being the one guy who had the notoriously stole. Yeah, yeah, like he, he, everyone knows he had a perfect game, but it's like this hilarious blemish that was totally outside of his control. So, and it's like great cocktail party talk. You're like, eh, I almost had a perfect game. You're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm happy to see that he's kind of approached this nonchalantly uh, in life because I guarantee if that would have been me, I would have never gotten over it. It would have been like the Ace Ventura laces out situation for me if I was going to I think in the moment, to me, the umpire would have been a worm and I would have transformed into Doc and I would have pummeled him into the ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. In baseball, you squash the bug, baby. Just squash the worm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he – right after it happened, he was just like, oh, wow, man, I can't believe you missed that call. And they just went right back to pitching. <laughs> <laughs> Which I felt was – I respect that for being quite the underreaction to it all. But, yeah, I don't think I would have handled that terribly well. You see guys, like, blow a gasket and have veins popping out of their head because a check swing got called the other way than they were hoping. And meanwhile, he just lost the crowning achievement of any personal pitcher's single game uh, that they could have. And was just like, oh, okay. Well, I guess I'll start this next guy up on a changeup. I don't, I don't know what you want me to do here. No, I, I would have refused to throw to the 28th batter. I would have had 100,000 pickoff attempts until the umpire gave me the call. <laughs> I am not pitching one time to this man at the plate. You will get this guy out. I I do love excessive throwovers. I think I'm the only person in the world who loves that because whether it's a home pitcher or a visiting pitcher, eventually boo birds come out if they throw over like three times. Like, 
You just don't even face the batter. You don't even put your foot on the rubber. Just continuously throw over there. Just play catch with a first baseman. I would do like a hidden ball trick. I mean, I would have done everything in the playbook under the sun to get the guy out on without pitching to the 28th guy. What if he would have just walked off the mound, pulled a Jackie Moon, said Tigers off the field? Right now. <laughs> then do they call it a forfeit? But there's no additional pitch, no additional batter, no ball in play. So you could take that review kind of into perpetuity, no? Yeah, I mean, were they? I, I assume the Tigers were not in the playoff hunt that year. I don't even know. No, I think the Tigers were good at that time. I think yeah. Miguel Cabrera won an MVP around that year. It's still a safe bet on my part. But anyway, like if your team's out of it, you just be like, yeah, then we'll play 161 games. I don't care. Like we're not – we are protesting. Yeah. I mean, best case scenario, you get the call, perfect game, you get a win. Worst case scenario, you forfeit one out of 162 games. And to your point, we're the Tigers. We're going to lose a good bit of those anyway. Yeah. Uh, Galarraga told the Ashbury Park Press, quote, it's a great job by them. They saw something not right, and they want to prove a point. I think that's good. That's what leads to progress, end quote. Hey, Mr. Galarraga, this is uh, Dan Jenkins from the Ashbury Park Press. Can I get a, a couple minutes of your time? Yeah, sure. I got nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> I, when he says that's what leads to progress, what progress is he referring to? Maybe he means like his own personal demons. I don't know. I, he didn't sound terribly fired up. He said they saw something not right and they want to prove a point. I think that's good. <laughs> this guy's just chill as hell. Yeah. Uh, apparently in this article on Yahoo, it says, for everyone involved, getting to hear directly from Galarraga was icing on the cake. He not only discussed the game in question, but his journey from Venezuela to America and his graceful response to Joyce's call. So did they just do 82 pages to get to talk to Armando Galarraga? Worth it. <laughs> Is this law it? school? Law school sounds so much easier than I thought it was. I don't think this was a law school class. I think it was an undergrad law class. Oh. Uh. Yeah, not to not to blow a hole in your whole deal, but I was gonna say, is law school just being pen pals with famous people and hoping for the best? Yeah, I I mean the fight I fought for Sammy Sosa in that cork bat, you would not believe. There's three years of my life I'll never get back. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that what lawyers talked about with each other when they go to like happy hours in a Marriott ballroom? It's just like, so who did you write? Oh, man, I couldn't believe Tom Hanks didn't win that Academy Award. We worked tires tirelessly on that case. Like, oh, okay. And um, to think that Night Court got pulled off the air, we wrote NBC Universal <laughs> tirelessly. We submitted our case. I'm taking a different spin on this. I think that this law professor has a 10-year uh, litigation on a sports bet that he made that he was going to call a perfect game that game, and he's just like – Baby, if this hits, we're making millions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the interest on that alone. So yeah. you think whoever he had this bet with has been trying to get paid for this for the last 12 years? Exactly. It's like, oh, hey, hey. I took Armando Galarraga perfect game plus 80000 okay? <laughs> And I'm not paying you that $10 I put on this until justice is served. <laughs> you know you robbed me. I feel like the odds would probably be higher than plus 80,000. Yeah. So, I, you know what? If that's the case, I'm all on board with this law school professor and also using uh, what he's done in his career, where he's gotten to, to be a professor at Monmouth University. I appreciate him abusing his power just so he can get paid. Secure the bag. If, it is, if he's like like tenured professors, they can do whatever he want. They want, right? Like they can't get fired. They're like insured by the university or whatever. Well, I I mean, yeah, yes, I doubt he's tenured, but because of his activities, we know of. <laughs> yeah. But he's also a retired judge, so I doubt he's like worried. He probably has a nice pension. 
He probably just – I don't know. I, I think if he got fired, he'd be like, I saw some – that's progress. That's progress. <laughs> Yeah, and I bet other people in the department didn't not see this coming. Yeah, oh yeah. Where they're just like, you see, you see what uh, Judge So and So is doing with his class? Like, yeah, I know he does this shit all the time. Like, he got a nine count in his ten count Nuggets from Burger King in two thousand six, <laughs> and that was our entire course one semester. Sometimes when you argue to judges, you look up at them and they're you can tell they're just not paying attention. Now I'm just going to assume every judge is like thinking of ways to get this perfect game reinstated. I mean, poor Jim Joyce. I mean, Jim Joyce had to think that the statute of limitations on this blown call from 2010 had passed. <laughs> Boy, was he wrong. Could this, could this get a civil case? No. I mean, there's damages in the form of lost winnings potential for the sports bet from 80,000 to one. I mean, if you're not going to award him monetary damages, at least award him out damages. You know, give him, he was robbed of an out. Let him put that out in his back pocket. So next time he goes out there, maybe, and he's been out of the league for years, but <laughs> let's say he makes a roster and he's got bases loaded. First inning when he gets back, things are going rough, but he's got two down. You think he could just raise his hands back? I got that out. I got that out in my pocket. Well, I yeah, like the, the Tigers make the playoffs, and they call him up in September, and they're like, he's got the one free out. What if we really need it down the stretch? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if Well, given that it's been so many years, I mean – the interest of that out has accrued over time. The compound interest of that he's out. He's got another perfect game. Yeah. Oh, man. So he's going to get two perfect games out of this? Is Armando Galarraga building a Hall of Fame resume through this? <laughs> wow. I I hope they win. I really do. My, my other favorite tidbit about this story is one of the students was from Australia and never seen a day of baseball in his life, and he was forced to do this project. <laughs> He's like, uh, I have a lot of questions about this case. First of all, what's baseball? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I really, all I hope that comes out of this is I, I want them to win, first of all. Uh, and second of all, I want whoever made that Sean Payton, Kevin James movie to follow up with a movie on this. You have Dave Franco as one of the law students. Uh, the law professor, uh, maybe Lewis Black is, Ooh, is pretty, pretty, pretty solid. Uh, Jim Joyce, who is a big, oh, that guy from, um, with the mustache who plays a cowboy in every movie, even though he's from California. Uh, he's like the dad in that horrible show with Ashton Kutcher, The Ranch on that. Oh, uh, you're talking about Sam, Sam, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, something. Yeah. Sam Elliott? Sam Elliott, yep. That's it? Yeah. yeah, that's his name. He does all the voiceovers for uh, Coors. And then we got to have some eye candy for this movie. Maybe Jason Momoa as Armando Galarraga. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see that throwing motion. Or I'd actually be fine with a bit of a curveball, and we just have, like, Owen Wilson play Armando Galarraga. Don't change the names. And no. Well, so because you brought up Jared Leto, I think it was pre-show. It was so, definitely pre-show because there was a yeah. lot of allegedly in what we were talking about. Yeah. So, oh, yes, yeah. So Jared Leto has been, like, notorious lately with, like, House of Gucci and the WeWork thing. He's just, like, going off the doing, like, horrible caricature impersonations yeah. of uh, th th these uh, different ethnic groups or characters. So I think we just get like Vince Vaughn and just have him lean into being like the worst Venezuelan you've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. But what if we got, uh, um, what's his name, Tim Burton? What if we get him to direct this instead and we do a complete reimagining of the whole thing? Like and a nightmare also, before Christmas? Exactly right. But we throw in another curveball. It's Tim Burton working for Tyler Perry Studios. And we get D.L. Hughley 
to be Armando Galarraga. But print, send it to the Academy. And the story is, what if the perfect game did happen and then the world spins into oblivion? Mm-hmm. Now we have close sun theory again. Or who was it that made Moneyball? Uh, uh, Ridley Scott? Scott? Was that who? Ridley Scott? Maybe? I don't know. When I also, asked... I I never know. You could do a whole episode on Tim Burton, to be honest. Like, An episode Disney, of the show? Like, Disney paid... Universal, I think like $40 million to rehire Tim Burton. There's like a crazy story about it uh, for another day. I I want there to be an episode. Doc and I aren't here. It's just you in your office at two in the morning, one single light on, and it's you doing like your own deep dive. <laughs> like, you know how those uh, there will be those people who do makeup their own makeup on YouTube who talk about like an ongoing missing persons case. And they're just, (laughs) yeah. So the stepdad apparently had threatened her numerous times when she was a child. And like, isn't it kind of funny that he now lives in Wyoming and I want you to do that, but whatever you want to talk about with Tim Burton. Well, it it just like, I I don't think he was worth what Disney paid, but I have a great deal. I have a great deal of respect for him, but Oh, maybe a longer episode. Also, like a nightmare before Christmas, I think it took two years to film. Like it was absurd. The uh, Disney was like heard the idea, was like, we're going all in on this. <laughs> what do people want with Christmas? Uh warmth, family, hey, wrong. They want to be scared. They want skeletons. <laughs> all right, fine. You got two years. <laughs> yeah, make it happen. Here's forty million dollars. <laughs> Yeah, he went the opposite of like the Clint Eastwood take on making videos. <laughs> Instead of just taking the one take and getting out of there, he's like, I'm taking a hundred. I whoever made Moneyball, I would like for them possibly, and I know I've mentioned about 10 different iterations of this film thus far, <laughs> but I want them to show like, you know, it's kind of grainy, but it's like sh- showing the footage of the call. Like it's showing him maybe in the zone the first few innings, and then it shows the call, and then it's like cutting to present day. And then all of a sudden, it's just like Dave Franco in the school library, like, man, how am I going to pass this law class? I wish I would have dropped this when I could. And then it goes on from there. Bennett Miller was the maker of Moneyball. Couldn't have less of an idea who that is. Yeah. Uh, Maybe we make it, uh, would you rather be a Farrelly Brothers uh, film or maybe Quentin Tarantino does it? What about Michael Bay? Let's just turn it into a giant action movie. Transformers show up. Yes. You have Tigers fans who's like, I remember that game. Now, I don't think all the lights exploded in the stadium after the call. Also, that- we can't you can't Tarantino it yet because we don't know the ending. Mm. Good point. Well, no, that that's easy. We just film the rest of the movie and then boom, film the ending. That's your first 10 minutes. There you go. Okay. Get it into production. You see, you know, once we get purchased by this, again, this very, very mysterious person, uh, I think we're going to have the money to maybe take this to our own studio. Or we just Coen Brothers it and have you do all the voiceovers and the omniscient character that does all the readings. Yeah. Maybe maybe we get Trey Parker and Matt Stone to do this. Armando Galarraga is not Canadian, I don't think, so... That, that may throw a wrench into things now that I think about it. All right. Well, that's going to do it for us. Um, I hope everyone learned something. It's been a very educational episode. Uh, be on the lookout for Ben's deep dive into Tim Burton. Yeah. Um, it will be before the quesadilla files, of course. Stay tuned for that. Um, don't forget to check us out on our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Uh, Doc, how much does it cost to subscribe to our YouTube page? Absolutely nothing. I'll be honest. I got a little worried you were going to say something. Check us out on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your podcast. On Twitter, at SJB Atlanta. On our website, sjbatlanta.com. On Instagram, at Spaghetti Junction Boys. Uh, before we go, want to thank our friends over at Manscaped. It's time to take care of yourself. So go to manscaped.com and get 20% off and free shipping with the code SJB Atlanta at manscaped.com. 
That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com when you use code SJB Atlanta. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Thanks as always for listening and watching, and we'll see you next week.